Mm -hmm. I apologize for not starting that sooner. No. You mean uh, we were anonymous up until now? <laughs> yes. You just been yeah. spied upon. Now we have to stop oh, well. talking about all the secrets. Yeah. We have to go back to talking yeah, about that. I should I should have gotten all my cussing in earlier. <laughs> no, and and again, the, the big divide between the uh the corporate space and the consumer space. Corporate space Nobody's paying the bill. It's it's a, it's a line item in a budget that gets approved, and as long as the company's making money, really nobody cares. In the consumer space, there are a whole lot of people that are just sick and tired of the. Well, it's still working. It does what it's supposed to. Why do I have to buy something new? Mac, uh, Apple was famous for that. How many people have old iPods or old iPads or old Macs that can't be upgraded? It was working fine, but now they can't do anything because they can't upgrade it. Yeah, see, I, I, I do. Yeah, go ahead. You think about, you know, people with uh, TVs or microwave. You know, if you have an old CRT TV that's sitting out in the garage and it works, why do you have to go to the greatest and the latest smart TV if it does what it was supposed to do? Why do you have to go to the latest and the greatest car with all the features, the, you know, lane departure warning and 82 other bells and whistles going off if all you're doing is going back and forth to the grocery store? So it's it's not just a technology, it's a mindset. Yes, just a and the mindset of most people is I'll use it until it stops working, until it stops doing what I need it to do, whether or it's my washing machine, dryer, car. Right. Whatever. Or give me a reason. Demonstrate to me why I should be doing this upgrade. Well, the operating system is really just an enabler for you to get to the software that you want to run, your browser, your email, your office suite. So... Um, whether you're in a, if you're in a business environment, if you have Windows 10 or Windows 11, you're still going to be able to do your job uh, for the most part, unless your company has deployed some kind of Windows 11 specific technology. Well, except for the maintenance and support costs. Right. right? I mean, the operating system does have to be maintained and upgraded and all of that. And bugs have to be patched. And, and breakages in the updates have to be dealt with. Um, and those can be painful and have been historically. Oftentimes when I help somebody with their personal computers in the local area, uh, they tell me, gee, Drew, when I bought the computer four years ago, it was really fast and now it sucks. Mm. Well, what I do is basically just reinstall the operating system back to the manufacturer's defaults and they get their fast computer back. Well, I just had a call today from one of the people that I used to coach at the library, and he calls me every once in a while, and he's got a lap, a Windows laptop, and he's got a couple of iPads and an iPhone, and he called me to say, I can't even get to Amazon. It, it just doesn't connect, and he lives in a uh, condo development uh, building with condos in it like seabright might be something like that as well and he couldn't his connections were bad and mm -hmm. and i asked him i mean look at your ipad and tell me whether it's got 16.4.1 and it did so it's not like his hardware was obsolete but he lives in a place where the wi-fi environment is such there's a there's an app if you have you probably get this I don't know if you can get it for uh, an Android phone there yes, may be can. an equivalent for the Android phone mm -hmm. of, of Apple Airport Utility which oh. allow which will do a scan of all the Wi-Fi in the place you're standing and I discovered even after getting a whole brand new optimum fiber gateway that my neighbor's signal, and I'm in a standalone house, okay? So my neighbors are 
more than 100 feet away, that their signal was stronger than my signal, my Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, so I have I, software on my Android phone that lets me, when I go to customers' homes, uh, look at all of the available Wi-Fi networks and what chance specifically I look for what channels they're running on. Yeah. Yep. See if there are two overlapping uh, networks that are within range of each other that are running on the same channel. Yeah. That's frequently that modern equipment is not very smart about avoiding crowded channels. For yeah. Wi-Fi. So, so it's not even the, the hardware. It's not your CPU or your RAM or your disk or anything like that. It's that your incoming signal, if most of you are just looking at stuff on a browser or a Chromebook, right? You're looking at stuff on a browser that your signal is getting overwhelmed and interrupted by neighboring signals. And so you need to go in and change what channel you're on so that you're not in conflict with the other Wi-Fi signals in your area, which yes. may even be stronger than yours when you're standing next to your router. Well, the well, other, well, the well, other well, with common, problem. sorry. Well, I had ahead. a couple of friends with that problem recently and used that Wi-Fi analyzer program on the mobile phone, found that their, their Wi-Fi was much weaker than the neighbors. It was faulty, faulty modem equipment. Got the modems replaced and they're back up and running with a strong signal. Yeah. Uh, the... And I suspect both in both their cases, the uh, modems failed because the uh, the landline uh, connection, what we call national broadband network, um, had gone off. The modems had switched to the uh, SIM card, mobile phone uh, tower signal. And I suspect that the uh, chips for the... Um, Transmission receiving couldn't handle the extra power and probably burnt out. The program I have on the phone is Wi Fi Analyzer. <laughs> yes, yep, that's, that's the one I use. I've been using it. Uh, it'll monitor both uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi Fi signals. Yep, I have that app on my phone too. One of the very common problems is that many home. Wi-Fi routers will have both 5 gigahertz and 2.4, and Wi-Fi at 2.4 tends to be much more crowded than 5 gigahertz, just because it's a narrower band, and so folks need to well, also because be paying attention to switch to their 5 gigahertz. Yeah, yeah. I have a thermostat and a, and a doorbell that only run on 2.4. Yeah. That's common. The, a lot of the old it appears technology, the, chip, the chipsets are cheaper for 2.4. So they're putting them into. You people who, who just checked that you have this app, is your personal, can you look and see, is your personal signal the strongest one where you are right now? It, yes. it, it is, but it's strange that I used to have more Wi-Fi networks around me, and they're gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I live in a townhome, essentially, and if I wanted to, you know, my next door neighbor has a Wi-Fi printer that has Wi-Fi direct on it, and the signal is strong enough that if I wanted to, I could print to his printer. <laughs> so, I'm within five feet of my router, so... For me, it's it's almost a given that my signal is strongest. Well, when I'm five feet from my router, I can still see the Orbi from some neighbor. And well, I can see other networks, but but mine is certainly by far stronger than others. Yeah, the Orbi is a very powerful router, and but it's still if it shouldn't be stronger than yours. Um, I upgraded my Comcast network a few years ago, and I was not getting the performance that I was supposed to get. And I own my own hardware. And I went out and I purchased a new cable modem with a higher DOCSIS support number and yeah. a new router with more memory in it. 
and my bandwidth uh, for my computers like tripled. Oh yeah. Did you go to Doxus three or even later? Uh, I think I have three point one. Yeah, okay. three point one is the latest one. Mm -hmm. I looked on here and said, oh, there is a signal that's second highest between my router and up state here and the range extender up there. Oh, it's my printer. <laughs> I can see my printer here. So sometimes you're going to get your signal, if it's not on the same on the right channel, it's going to get overwhelmed mm -hmm. collisions mm -hmm. if there's yes. activity. <laughs> And some people still have uh, old 2.4 gigahertz cell uh, home uh, phone systems, you know, wireless phone systems yeah. that can be on the same channel as their router. Yep. Uh, that's been known to interfere as well. But how, how does any of this affect your choice of Linux? What upgrades has Linux done? in the kernel and in the drivers to take advantage of the newer processors? What are you losing if you're not using one of the newer processors? <clears throat> on, on my laptop, this is my Linux laptop, <clears throat> I lose that I can't do virtual backgrounds. I've got an i5, but I can't do backgrounds. I'm not on that now because I got home late. I'm back on the <clears throat> win, win, win machine. That's an That's i3. Interesting. It's an i3 on the other machine, but it's a newer. So that's what I lose for sure on there is I can't do virtual background, virtual backgrounds with an i5 with my Linux. Right. And if you have VMware or VirtualBox, you really want to get a, an i7 to support virtual machines. Why, why does the i7 just gives you more mathematical processing capability? Otherwise, uh, I thought supports, it was the same as an i5. Um, it also supports virtual computing. There are, you know how we were just talking about- Are you suggesting software, that those- How software takes advantage of the hardware and VirtualBox can take advantage of things in the i7 processor. I say they, it works on my i5. I can run virtual machines, but I don't do, you know, heavy duty multiples. And <clears throat> so, so if you're going to run virtual machines, whether you're on Windows or Linux, you prefer an i7. Yes. Now that's one of the things that I was not aware of. One or of if you, other or if the other option is to go with an i9 because an i9 comes either in six or 12 cores and you have the ability to assign more cores, like a regular i3, five and seven typically come with four cores. So you can have two for your primary computer and two for your virtual, for one virtual machine. If you go with an i9, you can give four to the host computer and four to each of two virtual machines. I was, I had no problems doing that with any of the processors that I've used for VirtualBox, including an i7 or my current AMD processor. Bruce left too soon. We started talking about Linux and he lost out on that. The other thing about Linux is possibly the, uh, the software is a little bit more robust for communications. This is a while back I was having, uh, troubles with uh, connecting to Wi-Fi on a Windows machine. Um, I just plug in a little uh, a dongle that had, uh, well, it wasn't Linux, it was actually BSD Unix. I uh, plug that in and, and it connects straight away on the Wi-Fi. Uh, go, back, go back to the Windows and it was flaky. And I suspect there was something in the, uh, in the uh, Windows software that wasn't uh, wasn't quite right. No, uh, you, maybe you, maybe, maybe you go to the manufacturer and, and that problem has gone away. Maybe but, from uh, the manufacturer's website, you can get a newer uh, Wi-Fi driver. Yeah, it's Windows. 
tied it tied up with uh, windows. So, and so whereas the um, Linux or the Nomad BSD that when connected it runs straight away. So it certainly wasn't the hardware. <laughs> No, not the hardware. Has anybody been keeping track? I mean, with the Windows kernel, it being uh, built the way it is, the, driver, the drivers are external, right? They can upgrade the drivers separately from the kernel. But does anybody have a list somewhere or found a list somewhere of what the upgrades of the Linux kernel have been that take advantage of newer processors. Has anybody seen that? I mean, every kernel release publishes a list of a change log of all the updates, but I'm not explicitly aware of specific hardware features that are or are not being supported. But to be honest, I have not paid attention to specific hardware features. And I guess as long that, as the system works. Well, uh, I mean, running virtual machines is is an absolute requirement. So I'll definitely look for that when I pick a processor. But these days, it's almost hard to get a processor that won't do that. Well, it'll do it. But what Drew said about getting an i9, you'd want an i9 if you're if your business was to run lots of virtual machines. Yes, if yeah. you have a data center now, if you look at some corporate data centers, they'll buy uh, desktop you know, tow mini towers or rack mount computers that have Xeon processors in them. And they'll have many, many cores and they can run eight or nine you know, Windows servers simultaneously on one piece of hardware. But what specific architectural features are you looking at when you're talking about this? Uh, well, um, I mean, I, I understand that for the same generation of processors, you're going to have more compute power in an i5 versus an i or in an i7 versus i5 and an i9 versus i7. But no, it's yeah, the cores. There, there are server processors, you know, processors that are sold and marketed more sure. towards servers but so is there something explicitly identifiable that an i7 has and an i5 doesn't or an i9 has and an i7 does not uh well i know that the um an i5 and a 7 both support vert you know you can run virtual box and vmware however there are special instruction sets in the i7 processor that are unique to virtual machines that are not in the i5. Which ones? I can't name them specifically, but if you okay. just do Google on the i7 and what its features are, primary features are, and how they differ from the five, you'll see it listed. I did Google and I didn't find anything. That's why I'm asking. Uh, if I can, I'll, I'll, after the meeting, I'll look for it. Okay. If you can drop a link, that would be awesome. I just noticed that. Uh... Mike Rowan joined in. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Yeah, I just down, admitted him. Before we go into building his PC, uh, I threw a question out there. I never used one of those Wi-Fi analyzers on my phone or an iPad. So if there are any suggestions on which one to try out. Yeah. Oh, you guys who have Android, it on the Android? Wi-Fi analyzer is the, one, is the one that'll do it. There are, he, he kind of wants to know the Apple side. I just threw a question out in the chat window. Yeah, as uh, as most of the guys on here said, they've been using uh, Wi-Fi Analyzer on Android, Andy. Uh, would you put the name of that tool? Sergey, you said you had it. Somebody else said they yep. had it. Oh, John, yes. John Kennedy said. Just literally Wi-Fi Analyzer. So There's Andy. Wi-Fi Analyzer, Network Analyzer. This this one's called Wi-Fi Analyzer, and it's uh, the author is Kevin Yuan. 
Y U A N. I've liked that one for all this time. And that's in the Play Store? Yes. The Google yes, Play it, Store? Yes, it, yes, it is. But the Google Play Store doesn't do him any good. He has an iPhone. Oh. No, Andy has an Android, right, Andy? No, 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 no on Apple. That's oh, on, the on Apple, in the Apple Store, App Store, it's the yes. Apple Airport Utility. And it's free. Yay. Yeah, I also see one called Wi-Fi Analyzer in the, in the Apple App Store. It's yeah. I think it's by a different guy, but I'm not sure if it's has what the features are. Uh, I don't think it has those features. This a Apple Airport utility has the mm -hmm. features that it will scan all of the uh, Wi-Fi signals in your area and give you a list. I didn't find any other apps in the Apple App Store that had that capability. I see one called Network Analyzer. I see yeah, one I called a Network Analyzer that shows a list. Network Analyzer shows you a list, but doesn't give you all the information. Okay. Okay. So anyway, okay. I mean, thank you, th gentlemen. There's this one and whatever other one you can find that you like to play with. Uh, I believe the technology that I'm thinking of is called uh, Hyper-V. Yes. It's a hypervisor that has something to do with guests and their threads in the processor. Hyper-V is just a hypervisor. It's not a hardware feature. Um, oh, I see that here's an article that somebody talks about specific hardware features for Hyper-V. Um, Interesting. If you, if actually, what you can do is uh, Google um, best laptops for running virtual machines, and you'll see the hardware specs that they typically recommend. I mean, uh, on the Intel processors, there is a VTX flag, and that's the virtualization capability, the hardware virtualization support. What is okay? I don't see anything anything else that's required for Hyper V either. Well, there's data execution protection, but that's almost a given on many machines, and of well, course, a 64-bit processor. But again, you're not going to find too many processors that are not 64-bit. Right. Well, uh, I, from what I recall, yeah, having a lot of memory is a good thing if you are really going to run a VM, uh, you know, hypervisor like, uh, uh, God, what is that? Uh, it's based on Zen, but uh, uh, it's actually got some other nice features. I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll look it up right now. But uh, so maybe, you know, you can get fairly cheap desktops with a 32 gig RAM, maybe even more <laughs> used. So that might be a way to go. <laughs> RAM is cheap. Um, okay. You can always just drop more in. All right, here's what I just found out. Hyperthreading is a process by which CPU divides up its physical cores into virtual cores that are treated as if they're actually physical cores by the operating system. And it improves parallelization of computing doing sure. multiple tasks at once. And uh, it's e it's better for dividing up the cores between virtual machines. Yeah, but hyper-threading is not specific to i7 or i9. It exists on i5s. Um, well, I'm I'm looking at a uh, an Intel page that I just put into the chat box, and it talks about what is required for to support Intel virtualization technology, and it mm -hmm. lists five things. It says a processor, a chipset, the BIOS, the operating system, and the device drivers, and then it tells you that you can look up your processor and find the specs on that page, visit the processor specification site, and put in the processor number of your processor, 
And then you can look under things uh, using an example of an i7 that they've got, uh, an i7 12700K. Uh, they show that it's got Intel virtualization technology, Intel virtualization technology for directed IO, which is VT-D and Intel VT-X with extended page tables. So they're doing some things. That's that's with a 12,700K 12, i7. So different CPUs of different vintages are going to have different of these technologies. They got a VTX, a VTD, and uh, extended page tables. So there are features which, if you are going to run a lot of virtual machines, some of the CPUs are going to be better than others for what you want to do. But John, as far as I know, these features that you listed, the, the VTX, VTD, all, all of that stuff is pretty much present on most mid-level and higher processors and has have been for last about five years. Yes, five years. And in fact, I found one other table in which it listed for the decoding of uh, H.265. Mm -hmm. And based on which CPU it was and vintage, some of them could do it with such and such level of color. Others could do it with a higher level of color, like there was an 8-bit and then a 10 bit and a 12 bit color, and also whether it would handle 4K resolution. Okay. And so mm -hmm. those things changed as the processor generation increased. Some of the older ones didn't have as much power. So again, it depends on what you're trying to do. And somebody knew and built these things for specific purposes. Uh, we have somebody on here who I don't recognize. The 512 number who dialed in. That's not Andy, is it? Yeah. Hi, everybody. No, this is uh, Sam. Uh, I'm... Yeah, unfortunately, I have to leave very soon. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I'm just following the discussion. But yeah, uh, there Welcome. was a Zen hypervisor based uh, tool that came out, oh God, seven, eight years ago. And I'm searching for it, but not finding it. And that had some really neat features. Uh, does anybody remember that? Oh God. Uh, no. It's a type one hypervisor. And uh, anyways, yeah, sorry. If I find it, I'll try to so get some information. What? I'm not sure I understood the question. There was a basically something like you could literally be running 15 to 20 VMs on your, you sure. know, maybe a desktop. Uh, yeah. And that's what there were. That's even, what Zen was. That's what Zen's target was. That's well, that I mean, specifically that adapted like for bare, light hardware use. That would be bare, uh, you know, a hard, I mean, a bare hardware, you know, complete setup uh, from the ground up. But this thing was like a layer on top of Zen, and uh, it allowed for throw away VMs. And uh, yeah, my mind is completely blanking on it. Uh, and, yeah, the searches are not finding anything useful. So is, is anybody running any type one hypervisor? Just curious. Well, yeah. If you're running I, Windows, you're using a hypervisor. If, you, if you're if you running are. a virtual machine. Well, yeah. Yep. And so Sam, Sam, that was your name? You can yeah, rename, yeah. rename yourself because your phone number is not very illuminating. And we welcome no, you. No, no, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know of any way, like, the phone interface doesn't. So if anybody else wants to read me, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, Mike Rowan, we got started in some of the discussion we're having by talking about 
what you posted in the Linux group about building a Windows machine. And uh, we've been talking about processors and the fact that processors have advanced a lot and which processor somebody might want to have for different purposes, Linux or Windows. But something else that was a question that you talked about and Drew, I answered it later, Drew answered it. You asked about Thunderbolt. What's the Linux support for Thunderbolt? Thunderbolt 4 supported? I don't know. Don't have any hands-on experience with Thunderbolt. I know it's been supported for years. I don't know specifically about Thunderbolt 4. My latest. By the way, I just yeah. quickly I just found the name of that uh, yeah so tool I was looking for. It's called Cubes Q U B E S, and you can get all the details online. <laughs> Thanks. Um, ah, yeah, I think I saw that. My newest computer has a Thunderbolt port, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 4 port. It only has one, and, uh, and it's only got one USB 3 port. The USB 3 port gets taken up by my uh, dongle for my mouse, and I keep looking to buy a dock so that I can expand and I don't have an ethernet port on this laptop. And if I get a dock, I'll get an ethernet port and a few more USB ports, but a dock costs another $300. It's not like these things are cheap, but you get a new uh, monitor, even with your old Linux setup, and it will probably have a display port on it. it if you spend more, you might get something else that still has VGA or HDMI. But now everything is moving over to DisplayPort, which is driven out of the Thunderbolt 4 or 3, which is a USB-C connector. And so if you're building a desktop, I guess that that's not uh, not necessarily a problem, but you would probably want to put in a card that has a few Thunderbolt 4 ports on it. Yes, I could once I figured out what I would use it for. Uh, so I see information that indicates that Thunderbolt 3 and 4 support is there, but as of two years ago, there were some issues in Linux. I don't see any the, much current discussion, which implies that there isn't much volume of interest. Or maybe my Googling is faulty, which could be. Well, the ultimate test is what you get for throughput on the drive when you connect it to Linux versus Windows. Uh, I can run, I have a machine with Thunderbolt 3 and another one with 4 and another one with nothing. Um, I have an external SSD that is. Uh, brand new has uh, a thousand. It's rated for up to a thousand megabytes uh, per second, and I can run two uh, virtual. I run typically run two virtual machines uh, off of that drive simultaneously from my Windows computer, and okay. I can't do that on the computer that I have that does not have Thunderbolt in it. Now, does that external but, drive have a special Thunderbolt plug on it for it? Thunderbolt has always uh, used a USB-C type connector. What kind, so, of, what kind of connector does the drive have? It has a USB-C port only. But it comes with two cables. It comes with two six-inch cables. One that is USB-C to USB-C, and one that's USB-C to USB-A, in case you have an older computer. Mm -hmm. So, but have you come, I think the original question was about 
Linux support for Thunderbolt? Have you tried running Linux off of a USB key or something and benchmarking that? Well, well unfortunately, I don't have the ability right now to install Linux natively on the hardware that I have. Well, you uh, don't have to install it. Just boot it off a USB or whatever you, you can plug in. Oh, right. Yes, I can do that. I didn't think about that. Yeah. I can load a USB flash drive and then right. plug my SSD in and do a performance test. Yeah. I'll do that. Might, might, be, might be fun to find out. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a comparison between the two, Windows and Linux. Yeah. Is, is anybody else using hard disk Sentinel on Linux? That I, was, use... I, I have it, but it's very limited compared to the Windows version because it's free. Yeah. And it's command line, or you can run a GUI, which just prints out the same thing you do from a command line. But it, it doesn't do, so to me, it doesn't do much more than what you can find out in you know, in a regular disk program telling you how much, you know, how, how long it's been running and you know, how. There is, is, there is a mo monitoring package called SmartMon Tools, and there is a GUI package that works with it uh, that I've been using on both servers and desktops. I dropped it. You don't have to write it down, John. I dropped an email oh. into the oh, yeah. forum about this just about an hour ago. Yep. I remember seeing that before I went to the dinner. Yeah. yeah, might be might be worth checking out if you're looking for yeah. uh -huh. to compare, or if you're looking for a solution that's free. Well, I think I think the thing uh, that drew was the thing that attracted you, the fact that it could tell you that this disc is still at ninety one percent of effectiveness and stuff like that. Yes, that was my it, curiosity. Yeah, I the, sure the would like to know what the 91% means, especially well, for a hard disk. The thing about a hard disk is that there will always be bad sectors and they reserve a lot of empty sectors around the outside edge of the disk is what I read. And when they detect, when the disk hardware detects a bad sector, it maps it out and maps one of those free sectors from the outside. But there are only so many free sectors. So if it uses those up because the original sectors, enough of them go bad, like it's saying, I still have 91% of my spare sectors available. John, I yep. monitor all of my smart stats on all of my disks. Pretty much every single one of my disks do not have any sector replacement. When they do, I replace the disk. Um, when they start replacing sectors, you know, they are subpar, and, I, and I've seen them fail pretty quickly after that. John, John S., if you want to take a, a small side trip to answer your question, I have the uh, HD Sentinel on Linux. If you want to take a look at it, yeah, let me see it. You want me to? I can make you. Uh... Yeah, make, give me a. Open the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see it. Yeah, I, I've got it. But I can't. I can't show because that, that machine's. Uh, you can good. now. So you can now uh, share your co-host, Andy. Oh, cool. Oh, there, there it is. Oh, cool. But that that's a lot less than what the Windows okay. version, because the Linux have, is free. I have two physical disks. I have an SSD and I have a spinner. And that's that's the extent of the information. Uh, that's not a lot. Your disks program will give you more than that. Right. But again, John Kennedy brought up the key point. It was talked about and it's free. Okay. And so. you can see that it's, it says that no weak sec problematic or weak sectors were found. Mm -hmm. So it's looking to see and it can query the disk and find out how many bad sectors were mapped out. 
Yes, but I've never seen a total count of the total number of sectors that are available for replacement or what percentage of that is confused is consumed. That's yeah. why I was puzzled by the hard disk sentinel showing a percentage. So the health over there in this view says 99%. Well, but that's an SSD that corresponds to a an actual field in the in the smart stats for SSD. Yeah. So my, it, my, understanding, my understanding from information that I've read is that an SSD is more likely to fail without any warning. You know, it'll work perfectly until mm -hmm. it's going to fail, and then it just goes pluey. Really? Because mm. uh, I mean, th there is definitely an indicator of wear level within the um, within the and, SSD. And I know for a fact that they like to have more free disk space than spinning drives do. Um, I got down to about four hundred megabytes of free space on my terabyte drive, and when I was trying to copy files back and forth, you know, doing a speed test uh, to an external drive, um, the more free space I had on the internal disk, the faster my performance was. Yeah, af after you wrote that, actually, you or somebody else, I, I went to look up whether uh, disk fill level also uh, had a performance impact on SSDs. And I found that the, on the web, it says that it does, that the fill level, you want to keep the fill level on your main disk down below 75%. Uh, yeah, yes. And the same thing is true for SSDs because it's constantly moving stuff around. And now Mike Rowan was saying he was thinking of putting in a 500 gigabyte SSD, and I would think that given the option, I would put in a one terabyte SSD just so that I would always stay away from that fill level. Yeah, I agree. And the price differences are coming down so that it really doesn't have a huge impact. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're running Linux, you probably want to use a logical volume manager so that you can move your data between physical disks without disrupting your operating system or data layout. Mm. Yes, and we went through that with you once upon a time, right? No, I never, not... I never, never get around to doing an LVM presentation. Oh, so maybe we'll use that. But Mike Rowan's yeah. building a Windows machine, and so I get a one that... terabyte, get a one terabyte main drive. I thought that there was some kind of logical volume manager available under Windows. I've never looked into it in detail. Drew, maybe you know. Uh, what was the question again? Logical volume Is there manager some, for some kind of a logical volume manager under Windows? I under thought there Windows. was one built in. Oh, I can't answer that specifically. Okay. I thought that at one point in time there. Uh, Microsoft did a deal with Veritas and they, and they got a bunch of their functionality into the kernel. They may have. Uh, I'm not certain. But that was years ago when I was still in, this, in the storage. Um, Yeah, that. Uh, um, are there any LVM like solutions for Windows? And they're called dynamic disks in Windows. That's that sounds about sounds familiar. Oh, dynamic disks, yeah. So we need to look that up if we were interested in it for Windows, but we could have a discussion about. Uh, logical volume managers for Linux sometime. Yeah. Now now that's going to have to compete with another thing that I have in the works. I want to do a thing on destroying and resurrecting Linux, where we'll take a bunch of virtual machines and go get abusive, wipe out disk blocks and, the, and kill kernels and 
kill partition tables and things like that and then see if we can recover them. So that's something I have in the works. It's not quite done yet. But this this would go a long way towards helping folks recover from boot problems and unbootable systems and things like that because there's basically no such thing as a Linux system that cannot be recovered unless it's just completely wiped out. <laughs> You sound like somebody that really enjoyed Demolition Derby as a kid. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's it's exactly that kind of thing, except for not only do do are we going to demolish Linux, but we're also going to bring it back to life. But we're literally going to take DD and stomp all over disks and write zeros and garbage all over them. Well, people who are... Uh, system administrators should know how to do these things because they may have to do them on because uh, the probability of having a problem when you have a very large number of systems is much higher. For the person at home, it happens once in your lifetime, maybe. You think? I mean, and I then, hear of people that then, have unbootable machines all the time, right? People have boot problems, people have machines that die, and they don't seem to be able to recover them, and they end up reinstalling from scratch, which is an mm -hmm. awful lot of work as compared also, to recovering a system. It's also a, a CYA mechanism, certainly at the corporate level. No company sure. is going to invest the time to try to find out which one of the zeros is in the wrong spot on a local hard drive. There's because that. They know that an hour later, you can be back up and running on a newly imaged machine. Yep. So, but, uh, but, but again, as a as a user, when you get a new machine, it's probably going to take you a, three four days to a, anywhere from three four days to a week or, or longer to get that machine up to snuff to where you're comfortable and all the customizations that you want are done. Right, as an individual, back, which goes back to. Computer 101, there are only two kinds of people in this world, those that have lost data and those who will. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you build the machine, you have a fresh install, you put all your favorite apps on there, and you take an image. And six months from now or a year from now, if the machine pukes, no, you may not have all the latest and the greatest, but you have a very, very good starting point. You yeah. have all your basic applications, and you can go from there. So most people, I know, I know from a firsthand basis, if you're at a corporation, somebody says, my computer crashed, I got a blue screen on this, this isn't working, okay, fine. Shut it down. What's the, what's the serial number? Okay, confer, okay. Uh, go to lunch. And you just yeah. sent out an image. You just yep. sent out an image. An hour later, boot it up, log in with your... ID and password, and anything that was saved on the network is going to come down. They don't I'll play. We don't. We didn't play around at all with trying to troubleshoot. Yep. You know why? Why your machine was acting funky? Yeah, I, I work with a company that has a limit on their technicians for fifteen minutes. They're given fifteen minutes to troubleshoot the problem, and if they can't fix it, they re they reimage the machine. Yeah, and. Along that line, they're much more interested in preventing the problem. There's a, a whole lot more emphasis on keeping the bad guys out, all the cybersecurity, because sure. of the recent law changes where the corporate officers can be held personally liable if they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. So it's all about CYA and stay up and running as, as much as you can. The fact that you don't have your favorite background on your desktop, boo-hoo, we don't care. You're here to work. Oh. But an average guy is still going to go and fix the background. Oh, yeah. You know. If uh, they can. In, if yep. they can. In our right. place, in our place, you could do anything you wanted as long as it, vol it involved log off. And then when you log on, you're going to get what we told you you were going to get. So even if you could, perchance, 
save your background, change your background, it was gone the next time you boot it up anyway. Yeah. Does anybody know of a, a good program that runs on Linux that's a GUI that you can use to copy multiple files simultaneously for, for doing? I, I have a program on Windows called Fast Copy, and you give it like 20 files, and it buffers and it, it uses the maximum throughput of your computer and gives you um, better bandwidth in terms of uh, copying versus using File Explorer. And on Windows, on Linux, I was wondering what tool I would use to measure the how many megabytes per second I'm getting on the throughput of the drive. If I could jump in there, uh, John Kennedy, you're sitting back. I, I see you there. I'm going to steal your thunder a little bit. Drew, have you checked out Free File Sync? Yes, I have. Oh, Does Drew it, did a presentation on it, right? Yeah, Does well, it fit I, the bill? yeah, I know Free File Sync fairly well. It doesn't fit the bill for you for what you're looking to do? Uh, well, I was hoping for a program that would have a readout of how many megabytes per second I'm getting. Uh, that program, I have the paid version of that program, so I can do multiple threaded copies um, that speed it up a little tiny bit. But um, what I was looking for was more of a program that would uh, give me good graph GUI um, output for how fast the file transfers are going. Ah, uh, okay. But those are, those are two different things. like. If you Sounds like you're looking for several different things, right? Well, at, at least if you just at the command level start n copies with an ampersand, they're all going to be going at once. Now you've got a whole bunch of copies going at once, started at the shell command level, you know. Um, now you want to go look at the performance of the system. So what's your favorite performance monitor that will show you the full throughput of the interface? When you're dealing with IO, you are not going to, most of the time, you're not going to be CPU bound, therefore throwing more processor power that is more parallel processes or threads at it is not likely to help you. As a matter of fact, in many cases, and especially with physical hard disks with spinning rust that's going to hurt you well the thing you're going to induce seeks into the process that would not happen otherwise and therefore you're going to slow your drive down here's well, a more simplified version of what i'm looking for in windows if you just use it forget about third-party apps in windows if you use file explorer to copy a file from drive a to drive b it mm -hmm. tells you in windows approximately how fast the transfer is going in megabytes per second when you copy a file using the Linux file explorer from an internal drive to an external drive, does it show you those results? Uh, the tool that you're looking for is a command line tool called rsync. Okay. I don't know if there is a GUI equivalent. I've had trouble finding one for rsync. Um, yeah, I'm basically just looking for something that that spits out a number that says this is how fast you're going. Yeah. Well, are you trying to test your drive interface? Well, this was uh, in response to the question that we had earlier about whether or not uh, Thunderbolt has plays any difference in the speed performance between uh, running on Windows and running on Linux. Your GNOME disks. Uh, utility that comes installed on every Linux will give you a benchmark capability, both read only and read write. Oh, okay. And it'll run in about 30 seconds or so, maybe a minute. Um, is that available by default in Mint? Do you know? Yeah. Just hit your Windows key and type DISK. Oh, I have a disk, a program called Disks, and another one yep. called Usage Analyzer. Disks Usage Analyzer is 
a menu title for a program called Baobab that shows you usage across different file systems in a hierarchical way. It's a very, very nice explorer of trying to, for trying to figure out where your disk space was, went. But it takes a few minutes to gather its statistics. Um, but the right. disks program, if you select a disk, you will see a kebab menu on the upper right. Uh, yep. And under that kebab menu, there is... Oh, benchmark disk. There it is. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And there's the, the smart bits are in there as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I think we answered all of Mike Rowan's questions about his new PC. Mike went off to dinner, <laughs> said he'll be back sh shortly. I would say thanks, sir, because uh, uh, teaching me something new about the uh, kebab. When I first read about that, I'm going, what in the world is a kebab? And so I said, oh, that's the name, another name for the hamburger menu, the kebab. No, 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 the, the hamburger name. Menus have little lines yeah. that look like a hamburger. The kebab menus just have dots. Oh, okay. So you call that one kebab. Okay. Because right. so they, they, they look it. like kebabs on a stick, right? The hamburger and, and menu is, has going, those layers. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter whether the kebab is going up or across. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the official terminology is. Well, that's good to know. It is. Something new I can throw out and make people say, ooh, he sounds like he really knows stuff. Oh, Mike Rowan is back. Andy? Yeah. And Mike Rowan, by the way, you're muted. Andy? Well, one wonders why he wants to load uh, Windows on the machine at all. Should be loading up Linux and if he wants right. Windows, he's just doing it in the virtual machine. I mean, I had to end up asking whether, whether the uh, priorities for building a Linux machine, if I was just building a Linux machine, are the same priorities that I would have for building a Windows 11 machine. And I really didn't think that they were the same. You can just go out and think, I'm going to spend all the money in the world and buy an i9 and put 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes of RAM. And I'm going to put the fastest SSD. And I'm going to make sure I got a two and a half gig Ethernet and uh, you know the latest uh, 802.11ax. But do you need that for Linux? Is that what anybody is doing where they would need that for Linux. But you're not doing an operating system. You're doing a specific application, right? That's so the point. You, right. If you're the, if you're going to be moving data between network computers, you probably do want that two and a half gigabit Ethernet. Right. And but you better it, get and, you better get a new router too. Well, your whole network is gonna have to be upgraded. Yeah. If you if you're going to be doing that, um, you know, I think most of most of us are going to have a real hard time exceeding the the one gigabit networks that I that I hope most of us have. Although there may be some people, you know, if you're just streaming video, you you only need about maybe five to ten megabits. Yeah. Don't need don't need a whole lot. And if you're using Wi-Fi, it really doesn't matter how fast your backbone is. Right, your yeah. Wi-Fi is going to be almost an order of magnitude slower. My biggest problem with Comcast Wi-Fi six overcome all that. Uh, not enough hands-on experience. I'm I'm actually in process of trying to get a working uh, Wi-Fi six O access point. But mm. notice that I think most of us at home are on consumer-grade routers. And those consumer grade routers are just not into super high performance. Of course, they're getting better and better, but you know, I'm I'm starting to lean towards for actual high speed Wi-Fi. I'm starting to lean towards using a separate access point 
from the router. But we'll see. At, the, at this point, I managed to buy an access point and a power over Ethernet adapter to make that access point work. And even though they came from different sources, they were both dead on arrival. It was amazing. Yeah, that was that was painful to hear. Quite a, quite a coincidence, seems to me. I'm glad you were able to get, a, get help from Henry to test it. Yeah, uh, it, it was absolutely awesome that, that, that he helped me out to test both of those. I was shocked that both of them were bad. That was the most amazing uh, part for me was to see some of the comments back and forth. You had an issue, you had a problem, you needed this. Henry yep. threw out the volunteer flag and inside of a day, everything was resolved. Yep. I mean, uh, the TDU, the typical dumb users among us, would have called up tech support and we would have burned through 82 hours of elevator music and still not had it resolved. Yep. So I oh, it's absolutely a blessing from my point of view. Oh, no. Kudos to Henry and, the, and to the club. Yeah, you yeah. talked about the uh, pellet smoker as well. Yep. Yeah, yeah, my son-in-law has one of those, and I asked him about it today, and he said, well, everybody knows that the sensors on those are crap, and that everybody goes out and buys external sensors. So he didn't even get Bluetooth on his pellet smoker because he was buying the uh, external oh. sensors for but which that's he has completely now an, separate. An app. Okay. I'd love to figure out what the protocol is and, the, and control that smoker from with my software or at least from my desktop or both. Or from, nice. or from your your phone, because he's walking all over the place, you know, right. and he wants to know when something is ready or when well, it's hit a certain temperature or a certain number of hours, yeah. and he can monitor it. But it's got, well, auto, the, it's got an auto feeder for the pellets, and the temperature is absolutely stable, better than his oven. So Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're amazing devices, and, they, and the, the construction is pretty consistent across many different manufacturers it's mostly in the in the quality of the metal work and the and the quality of the insulation and things like yeah. that but but they're all basically an auger that feeds the pellets plus a fan that evens out the temperature by blowing air around plus a heating element that fires those pellets his brisket is wonderful that's my next target But uh, but many of those apps are very primitive, and the, those apps are in particular not good at capturing data and exposing data, right? So one of the things that I want to be able to do is is just monitor the process and and be able to look at it as 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 a data set in the future, right? So you know, essentially, a temperature versus versus time graph right for both the 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 smoker itself as well as for whatever i'm cooking All right if we switch back mike was looking at getting an amd processor yep how many of you are using amd processors for linux i am now as of about two months ago any difference just cheaper. Uh, works just fine. No, no noticeable difference whatsoever. It's I think it's six cores and twelve threads, and it's a, and it's actually reasonably inexpensive. Like I think the processor itself is something like one hundred and thirty dollars. We didn't have any topics. Does anybody have any topics that they want to bring up?
John, um, Mike Rowan here. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, I want to thank everybody for their info they gave me. Um, I just think it's time to upgrade and I'm confused. You know, um, I maybe posted it to the wrong forum, but you know, I appreciate all you guys uh, info that you gave me. Um, yeah, I want to make another 10 year machine. And, uh, you know, I don't care if it costs 20 or 40 bucks more for this, that, or the other thing, uh, if it's going to last me for, you know, that long, I'm having trouble, you know, cause I haven't looked into hardware in a long time, figuring out what motherboard, everyone's a gaming motherboard. I'm not really a gamer, um, other than Sudoku, it doesn't need a gaming board. <laughs> And right. uh, so, you know, I don't want to overspend, but I'm, I'm not, I'm still willing to do it right the first time. So you guys information has been invaluable, but I'm still confused. There's so many motherboards, you know. It's, it's really, unless you have specific features in mind, it's just price versus what you get. Right. right? Yeah, you know, or the and, ports. I mean, do I, you know, will I need Thunderbird in three years? And, and I should absolutely. buy one now. Now, yeah. Thunderbolt. So. Thunderbolt in three years will be all that you'll be able to get. Right. Hey, Mike, I have a question for you. Because um, I know I'm, I've never built a machine by myself. Uh, my son worked in a store. They built them all the time. I know other people who have built them, but there's like, there seems to be a, uh, you know, uh, a north and a south divide there, build or buy. And on the build side, oh, you can get every component that you want, put it together, and you understand how everything's put together. On the buy side, there is the camp that says, well, you can basically specify whatever you want. They'll put it in there. But... With their expertise, they already know what components are going to work the best together. So my question to you is, how did you come to decide to build it as opposed to just going and working with the specs and having one built for you? Okay. I'm buying from Dell. Well, I built my last two systems. I bought everything. I did all the research. And I thought I saved a lot of money compared to what it would have been if I had someone else build it for me. And they got, I mean, this thing's 10 years old and it's still, it's an I-5 or something and it's still good. It's just, you know, the numbers are way low and um, I just want to be ready for the next generation of whatever's coming out. Sounds like my last two. Because you built your last two, you want to build this one also. Well, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with my case and all the fans I got. It's a, you know, and uh, the way the hard drives fit in it. Um, I'm just going to, I thought I, maybe I'm wrong here. I thought I could just buy a new CPU, motherboard, and cooler, and maybe a graphics card. Um, and I'd be, uh, home, be a home run. And I don't mind doing the work. I'm pretty uh, handy. I need to be RAM too. Pardon? Might need, oops, might need uh, new RAM. Yeah, well, yes, I'm definitely buying 32 gigs of RAM. Yes. You definitely need RAM. One of the things that you want to look at that I haven't heard you mention in the, in the discussions is making sure that your power supply is up to snuff. The newer processors and newer motherboards tend to be occasionally more power hungry okay and, and I, certainly that is the case with graphics cards as well okay i you know, did I mention that I, in my I'll last response to you as well yeah right. i mean i wouldn't keep the same box the okay. one advantage of buying a new box well there so going back to some of the things that have been said in the and what andy mentioned one advantage of buying a new box is that you get to keep your old system. So if, so you can have two computers and you can retire the older one whenever you're ready for it to go. Right. Okay. Um, I, I do understand that because I still have an old the box. Other, yeah. The other thing the is I've one. built 
and bought systems multiple times. And in my experience, one of the things that you get with a system that you buy mostly, not 100%, but mostly, they tend to be quieter and better ventilated than, uh, than the systems that you build. Okay. Uh, I appreciate so this advantage. input. Yeah, I really appreciate the input. Uh, the other thing is that modern cases and modern power supplies are so much better than they were 10 years ago. Well, the power supply has been replaced. Um, I'd have to look it up, but it's four or five years old. Um, but it's it's worth looking into it. And okay, you know, and and it may just be the big advantage that you get with a system that you build is that you know exactly what every component is. Not right. only that, but you are prepared to rip out any and replace any component in it because it's no big deal. You put them together in the first place, mm -hmm. right? You can't get that kind of an advantage with a system that somebody else builds, right? It's a, it's a discovery process to understand how they ran the wiring, what what is connected to where, and all of that. I've been through it enough to where I can figure these things out, but it's it's not tr too trivial. So that's that's kind of the trade-offs in my mind. Right. You get I'm, to, I'm just trying to save a little money by not buying everything I don't need, you know, that was still you know. viable. But um, I think I'm in the same 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 boat in that my main machine I have built twice. It's probably getting time for another replacement, build or whatever. So I'm trying to look at the cost factor, compare, okay, just like you, I'm going to have to have a motherboard processor, new RAM, because it won't work uh, with the cooling you coming with it. Power supply might be able to go check. But when we've taught our classes uh, with our club, we taught a number of years before COVID, build your own. And we'd go through all the specs you would need We'd take a field trip to Micro Center. Everybody get a cart, go through, build, and then come back the next week and put it together. The machine I'm on now, I also built. And it's a machine that my son, my grown up son, uh, gave me all the parts that said, Here, Dad, this is like Christmas. You got to put it together, which you know I've done before. But I noticed that this last time, and it's a, a gaming kind of machine, is that all the small connectors I'm having a harder time seeing. I need to get some kind of giant magnifying glass or giant uh, uh, reading glasses to be able to, to see. And that's the part worries me, if not being able to do that without somebody else having to come. So maybe it's going to be easier if it's about the same amount of money get a pre-done box and not have to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your input. I, I don't think that you usually save money by building it yourself. Uh, just because the people that build them by, buy parts in bulk. Yeah. Also yeah. when you're building it yourself, you tend to pick higher quality components as opposed to making do with whatever the limited choices there are in terms of buying a machine, whether it's custom built for you or from a relatively small selection of parts that they offer, you know, or whether it's just a pre-built. Right. You're, I agree with you there. Yeah. And it, it sounds, you weren't here for the whole meeting, but we talked a lot about CPUs and the evolution of CPUs and their associated operating systems. And what I got from listening to most people here and other places is either you are dissatisfied with the speed of your computer or you're satisfied. And you're satisfied no matter how fast it is. So spending a lot of extra money on that, unless you're doing something specific where you notice that it's slow doesn't make any difference. Yep. My, my problem is that I've got a little quirk that we can't figure it out. Every so often, the keyboard and mouse disappear, lock up. Audio wow. can still work. You know, I can be watching a YouTube video and I'm listening to it. All of a sudden, I look back 
and the picture is frozen. I have no mouse, no keyboard. I can't go into the terminal to shut things down. I just have to reboot. And that's and, Linux. Yeah, yeah. Really? And yeah, yeah. It's, I'm still, uh, that's it. Is and, that is is your do you have an SSH server running on your machine? Can you log into it remotely? No. I, I, I have, I, I can, that was one of the, the guy that's our Linux guy that I learned from, you know, I have a, a, my laptop, I can SSH, but it doesn't find it. When it freezes up, it doesn't find it. But I know it's still working because one night I was doing a backup and I could still see the hard drive light flickering. And the next day after I rebooted, I found that I had a successful backup. So the back down, the backside is working, but it's something in the graphics because no mouse, it's frozen, no keyboard. There's nothing I can do. Have you looked at your system logs? Well, I mean, there's got there's got to be a way to troubleshoot something like that, we, especially if it's not and, completely dead. Yeah, well, and part of the problem is if, if if the computer locks up, then sometimes I lose the you know sometimes the logs aren't doesn't record what's going on. So that's why I'm thinking that's, you know, I probably need another get a new processor with graphics because it's got to be graphics issue. And so that's why I'm, uh, if it weren't for oh, that, I mean, I'm happy with that machine. It's not, it's working fine. It's got more yeah. RAM in it than I'm using. When and you I have agree. Running. Yep, go ahead. I was gonna say, and, and, and John, I agree with you about the, the, the system. I can remember helping somebody buy their first computer 20 years ago. And there were two different ones to buy. One was cost more than the other because it might have, I don't even remember what it was in the processor. But if you didn't fire up the two computers at the store at the same time to see that one was ready to go a little bit before the other one, at home you would have never known there's any kind of a big difference. Right. John? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. You you mentioned that your graphics froze and presumably it, your keyboard and mouse may have been working, but you wouldn't see any feedback because your screen was not functioning. Yes. Is it possible? Was your audio on? Like you, yes. you mentioned that you were watching a movie and did the audio stop or keep going? Keep going. Okay. So it sounds like it may have been just your video and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. And so we've tried to check, you know, the, uh, the uh, and how much point, RAM for the video. And, and at that point, you should be able to log into it over the network and diagnose the problem. Yeah, and that's I try to do that. The, the, after it happened, I ran over to the laptop, SSH to it, and it says can't find it. You know, can't find that that other one. That would be so, extreme. That sounds extremely bizarre that your video would go out, but your audio wouldn't, and your network would, so, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. When you have uh, the machine running properly, can you SSH from Windows into the Linux machine and run a terminal? I, I, when I have my laptop, when I have the desktop running right, I can SSH from the laptop, Linux laptop into that and back and forth. I don't do much with logging into you know, into Windows. Um, oh, so I can SSH and I can transfer files, no problem. But whenever that mystery thing goes and the keyboard shuts down and the mouse shuts down, and I've tried unplugging the USB plug, I've tried a different mouse. Does it it's, respond it's to a ping? John, I, I can't get to a terminal. John, there, one, yeah, Andy. One, one suggestion that I've used a couple of times, whether it's on Windows or on Linux, I always have a backdoor type user. Right. It's just sitting there in the back. So like when, when your machine hangs, the video goes, you can't do anything. When you're trying to SSH in, are you using the account that's frozen or are you going in using a different account? I'm using the account that's frozen because I was trying to grab logs, like Sir J said. Okay, but, and that's what I'm suggesting. What okay. I'm thinking is if you had, uh, you know, your backdoor user, you had a second user mm -hmm. set up on your Linux machine, you could try to SSH into it on through the second user. Okay. And see if it's a, see if it's a user-specific problem or if it's OS-specific problem. 
Good mm-hmm. question. Good, good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. John, another yeah. thing. If you can get in on the SSH, you know, you're dealing with a multi user system. If you can log in, okay. Well, now you narrowed it down. Now it's a it's a user profile problem. Hmm. If you can't log in even with a second user on a multi-user system, well, it's beyond. It's not a profile issue. It's not a. It's a much deeper issue. Yeah, we had hoped that I'd be able to just go into terminal, and right. and but no, because the keyboard doesn't work, so I can't hit Alt F one to get into terminal. Right. Well, well you, hold on. You can hit F one. You're just not seeing a response. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And you, you now when well, it's like that, can you ping the desktop from your laptop? I haven't tried that. I just tried to SSH it. Uh, for whatever uh, it's worth. Well, the thing Another, is that he, he said that the audio was still going. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, pinging it should work as well. As Sergey said. The only thing that disappeared was actually the video. And right. that could be a video card overheating. Yeah, which there, this is a video processor. There's no card. I thought about putting a card in, but then you're going, okay, it's a, it's a nine year old processor. And oh, so you know, it's, it's probably a, onboard video. No, it's, it's, a, it's an AMD um, okay. graphic processor. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I the other you, thing, the, the other thing that you may want to try is that the, uh, there may be, there are monitoring tools that will let you record the CPU load, and maybe running a process in the background just that just records your system load to a file, and identifying what happened before, right before. Yeah. A number yeah, of froze, times, maybe, every, every time maybe we've indicative. heard of something like this, it's been a heat problem. And if it was just the heat for your audio for your video processor, mm-hmm. okay, it could just be a hot spot. Because if the computer comes back eventually, that's because just, it's cooled off. Well, I, I it never comes back because I always have to hit the restart button so I could get back to business. I've never let it sit for hours, I don't think. When yeah, was the last time you back. pulled? The, when was the last time you pulled the cover off and cleaned the dust off the fans and stuff? I have the cover off half the time just to, to give it extra. If that was a heat problem, and oh, so I... the cover's back on, and I haven't had the problem for weeks. Well, with the cover off, you should have the problem because you're not getting the proper circulation. Mm-hmm. Yep. But when I had the cover off, it also went out. That's the that's the crazy thing, you know. Is well, that it's such a weird. Try setting up your backdoor user and see if you can you know, make sure you SSH in and yeah, it makes, and it, yeah, and makes it, good sense. And if you can't ping it, you can't SSH. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turn down AC. Put it in the fridge. <laughs> uh, don't laugh. I had a. I had a friend of mine show up with a brand new computer a couple of years ago and said the computer would work for five minutes and then cut off. We debugged it by putting the computer outside in November and noticed that it ran longer. Okay. Therefore, Uh by definition, it was a heat problem and the heat problem was solved by removing the CPU and replacing the paste on the CPU between the CPU and the heat sink. I thought about okay. that that be next, yeah. but I figured, hey, if I go to the trouble to take the paste off, put a new, new processor, you know. It's right. Well, in, in your case, it can't be the CPU if your audio is still going. Yeah, yeah, but it, right? it, that's it's crazy. But and but it it's seems total. To... But it's it could be a kernel problem that's causing your CPU to go into a, into a tight loop in the kernel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and therefore things are not responding on the I/O side. Right, and I recording, recording it, the, the system activity up to the crash or up to the hang might give you an idea of what's going on there. I, I think that also it might have to do with the video in that if I'm watching a lot of YouTube or you know watching you uh, Zoom meetings that have been recorded, seems to hit sometimes when that's what's going on. Long periods of time of, of the, the uh, video watching that might be indicative of your of your video circuitry overheating. Yeah. 
Uh, there are <laughs> there are likely to be temperature sensors in the in your CPU and and around your motherboard that you you may be able to get statistics out of. Yeah, I know that on Windows there's a program called SpeedFan that will tell you what the temperature of the CPU is. There might be something in, similar to that on Linux that will report to you what the temperature of the processor is. There's lots and lots of stuff that will give you temperature information in various places where it exists. But usually you don't think of that until it's frozen and you can't get to the program. Right. But if <laughs> but if you can record the data yeah. that's periodically sampled, you might be able to examine it later. Yeah, and if it's running hot while it's running, you'll know that it's uh, potentially the problem. You know, you want to keep the CPU within a, I don't know what the normal working range is for your CPU, but. Yeah. Um, you still have available. I mean, decades ago, I used to debug stuff using a, a little uh, pressure can of canned coal. Um, was able to actually spray it on individual chips to cool them down. I don't yeah. know whether such stuff's still available. Crank the AC hey, and turn the house down to 60 degrees. Are any of those videos you're watching have uh, two or three X's in the title? No, no, these are all <laughs> you know, B BCUG videos, uh, oh, APCUG. Okay. Okay. That's not too hot. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> I should I should say, oh, they never freezes up when I watch those. <laughs> um, well, trust like me, it's not the company, it's not the conversation, it's the hour. I'm going to be bailing out now. Very enjoyable with no formal presentation tonight. And I hope Bill Chris's uh, circumstances take care of themselves. I hope so. Have a good also. night, gentlemen. Thanks again. I hope so. Good night, Andy. John, night. I just dropped the link in chat with some suggestions for temperature monitoring software mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah, good text. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I would take a look at that as the for, as the next choice of uh, Keep monitoring uh, that stuff. You know, power the computer off and then let it run. Off, you know, keep it off until it's completely cool. And find uh, out what the what the temperature is when you first power it on, and then find out what it is four or five hours later. Right. Well, it, it's easier if, if you can reproduce it quickly. If it takes forty eight hours to, at random to reproduce it, then it's harder to diagnose. But oh yeah, it, it's it's been days since I've had to do it. Yeah. And I had to. I hear you. <laughs> and I, well, I had to reboot but, the other day because I went to hit the CD button and I hit the. Re Instead. But that's why I'm suggesting putting something yes. together to record the data. That way you're just taking up disk space to record a little information. Yeah, that's that's good. Mm. Right. I've got that. And then if, if and when it happens again, you can go go look and, and see if there's something leading up to it in the data. Perfect. All right. That's why we have these meetings. Mm. Well, we had plenty to talk about one way or the other. We did. And we didn't even do any, anything about Git. So we, um, we will proceed with that and LVMs in the future. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to know more about those. I always see it when I go through the installation program. Do you want to do this or LVM? I'm going, I don't know that stuff, so no. Yeah, well, uh, build yourself a virtual machine and do LVM. Okay. You will be thrilled. All right. Well, I successfully loaded GR Sync, and it shows the megabytes per second in the transfer rates. And I just got twelve going to a traditional, uh, regular three USB three flash drive. Twelve is really really slow. Yeah. So I'll try it. Well, well, it's also in a virtual machine, so. Um, what I'll 12 try it. is really, really, really slow, right? Um, if it, I'll, tr I'll try it running natively when I boot off a live. Yep. Drive. Okay. I mean, to an SSD, you should be seeing at least a couple of hundred megabytes. Oh, no, this is, this is not an SSD that I, the 12. This is just a. Uh, oh, it's a, a USB it's, flash drive. 
Oh, it's, okay. It's, Got it. It's, it's, yeah. I'm not expecting to get uh, this. Oh, in that case, your flash drive is likely not to be USB 3, right? Or, no. or if it, even if it claims to be USB 3, it may not be. I discovered recently, actually had a recent experience with a USB drive that claimed to be one terabyte in USB 3. Yeah, it was USB 2. And by the time I wrote about 100 gigabytes to it, it died. Mm. Very important that the cables match. A USB 2 cable plugged into USB on 3 on both ends will only do USB 2. Yes. Well, Plus, they have generation one and generation two. and <laughs> Yeah, they're trying but, to clean some of this stuff up, but then they're going to jump to Thunderbolt and DisplayPort and stuff like that. And well, it'll be USB 4 before you know it. Well, it exists. I, I just got myself uh, some nice USB flash. Yeah. micro sdmc card adapters these are supposed to be usb3 and i got these nice tiny little chips that are 64 gigabytes a piece supposedly for about ten dollars a piece for five of them uh, so um i wonder what kind of speed i can get out of these guys these are these are sand discs so they should be reasonably performant oh the the, the actual micro sdxc card are PNYs actually the 64 gig ones? Yeah, that's what I'm using as a PNY. Yeah, okay. but the um, the the S the an external SSD, especially one that's a uh, an M.2 um, uh, flash drive, is going to give you much more throughput than a that that thumb drive. Well, we'll see. Just depends on what you need. But um, yeah. I'll I'll do some testing and let everybody know what the difference is between Windows and Linux. That would be interesting to to yep. see what the difference is with the same hardware, right? That should be very informative. Yeah, that you mentioned cables. When Sergi gets his uh, equipment replaced, re all the equipment replaced. Uh, if he's using uh, Ethernet cables, make sure they're at least six cat six e. If he wants high speed throughput, you mean five e? Six e. Six. Why would I would need six? Five e uh, support. Five e supports one gigabit just fine, and I don't have anything higher than one gigabit. No. Uh, Didn't you say that you were trying to get Wi Fi six working, Sergey? Well, that's the goal. That's what I bought. It was a Wi-Fi 6 access point. Yeah. I find I get better throughput on my Wi-Fi than I do on my Ethernet. Oh, that's, that's bad. That's an indication of a that's problem, isn't it? Yeah, that can't be. You've got a one gigabyte Ethernet and no. Well, you, well, you should I, never I should, get... I should, I should rephrase that. Uh, on my Fire Stick, the USB port that connects to ethernet is not, is only a hundred megabit per second. Uh, if, you, if you have an Amazon Fire Stick, yeah. the, the ethernet connector is not a gigabit. So it's a hundred megabit? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll have to take a look at mine. Of course, so it's I'm fast running, enough. I'm running a benchmark on one of those things that I just showed on the camera. And it looks like it's running right around about 97 megabytes per second is what I'm getting for to these as SDXC chips through that adapter. Right. That's not bad. That's not terrible. That's pretty reasonably within the range that I would expect. Right. I wasn't expecting to get anything towards 200 megabits, but 100 is, is pleasant. And it certainly indicates that it's USB 3, because USB 2 can't go that fast, even theoretically. Um, I Right now, Amazon has, I don't know if it's still, but uh, they did have on sale uh, Samsung, uh, I think they're called the i7s. Um, 
SSD drives and they're, they're about 40 to 5% off their regular retail price. And a, a two terabyte drive is $140, $150. And Windows easily gets 400 megabytes per second on it. These are, I'm not sure I understood. Are these? They're, they're external drives that are okay. USB, USB C. Okay. Um, and so they must be, they must be USB three, right? US, yeah, US, USB C. Well, USB C is just a connector, right? It, well, the, um, it's using the PCIe, I think, uh, express architecture. When I, when I go into Windows um, Device Manager and I plug in a flash drive, a regular thumb drive, yeah. uh, it connects up to the USB port in the Device Manager. When right. I plug in my SSD drive, it loads a hard drive controller driver. It doesn't connect to the USB, even though it's physically plugged into the same port that a flash drive is plugged into. Well, then, then it's got to go through the USB driver because that's what drives the hardware. It probably... No, 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 because if if he's doing this on a Windows machine with a USB Thunderbolt port, it it determines what it's supposed to but, be, even though the connector is the same. Yes. It supports power in, display port out, USB 3, Thunderbolt, all of them. So, the so you're connector. telling me that over the same physical connection, it yes. runs multiple physical protocols. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Okay. You you can something uh, I'm not, something I'm not aware of. The marvels of digital communication. Yeah, All modern it needs computers. Is a yeah, a lot of modern computers today just have uh, a couple of Thunderbolt port. My my Dell one laptop. One Thunderbolt so. port. Yeah, I have two ports on my computer. One is a Thunderbolt C and the other one's a Thunderbolt C. Only one of them is used by the power cord. Um, so I only have one free port on my laptop. Yeah, mine too. I put that in that one of the posts that I had there. I got one Thunderbolt port and a USB uh, B port, USB A, B, whatever. And the A, the, the USB port is used for the dongle for the uh, wireless mouse. Mm -hmm. But if I want Ethernet or anything else, more USB ports, more Thunderbolt ports, I need to buy a dock. And the docks right. go for $300. Yeah, I have a Dell dock that I paid over $200 for. And it supports up to three monitors. It's got USB-C. It's got USB, yeah. you know, A. So they're, uh, and they're all and they're all going in through the one through USB C one wire. C yes, port. all and one wire. And it handles. It charges the laptop. It runs the video. Um, it does everything all through one cable. Interesting. Sounds like I'm I need gonna, to read up on this. I'm going to yeah, bring the know. meeting to an end. I hope I'm going to give. I'm going to count to ten so that everybody can copy the. Anything they want from the chat, although I copied it and I will send it out as well with our truncated video. I just did a save. Thank you. Especially since Sergey got me that. Um, is there yeah. is there a, an actual way to save the chat? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, when oh. you click on the chat button, go all the way to the bottom next to the smile. And there's three dots, and that's it. Oh, you I do. see. Yeah, I see that there's a file thing and ah, a screenshot. Save chat. Thing. Hey, I didn't know that. One more thing that we learned today. Oh, okay. <laughs> we keep yeah. keep, you keep you learning hear, new you, stuff. Yeah. Well, you don't hear Judy and I keep talking about that at the uh, Wednesday workshop. Don't forget to save your chat. Don't forget to save your chat. Ah. With the host, though, there's it, the setting for Zoom with the host. You can set it to automatically save chat. Yeah. I, I usually get the chat in there, mm -hmm. but that's cool. And maybe we should mention it at some meetings a few times because we don't have the same people all the time. But anyway, we don't always right. have great um, stuff in the chat either. Maybe. But, uh, well, maybe one last question. If you call the three dots a kebab, 
What's the oh, knowing yeah. one? <laughs> uh, John? That. Yeah. Yeah. Fred, maybe it's worth posting the chats along with the videos. Yes. Right. At the time when the, when the videos get posted to YouTube, it's probably worth making the chat available along with them. Maybe edit them. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, you you can you can redact at will. <laughs> I can add the chat at the end of the video. I can just turn it into a video. Um, you could, but that that makes it harder to cut and paste from the chat. It's the text that's in the chat yeah. that's valuable. Ah. Uh. Yes. Yeah, you, you want to be able okay, to pull I won't do it too. that way. Yeah. It's Sometimes being it's, smart is not good. Because you, you, you can just paste paste the chat into, into the comments well, or it's, into it's the a text description. File. Right. It creates a text file. Or so. or you can just drop it in group.io. There's a place for files there. Yes. Probably a good idea. Anyway. Yeah. What's what's nice is if if John opens up his text file. He can go in and edit before he saves and posts it. I will. I usually edit the videos and anything else that gets said. Take out exactly. at least the silences and the fumbling and stuff like that. Make I, us all I, look good. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, everybody doesn't. Uh, yeah, need but to you got to get you got to get better at it. You know, yeah. I mean, there are yeah. things you have to be able to do. Yeah. What's the video editing software you use? Hmm. Say it again. What video editing software are you I use, using? I use VSDC Free Video Editor. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I use do. that is because it allows you to show the audio waveform and expand it by a factor of four so you can see a large audio waveform. And mm -hmm. editing by finding a place in the audio waveform where a silence is or when somebody says something is much more accurate than trying to do it on the video. I bet. Yeah, if anyone's interested in a quality, high-end, free video editing program, uh, DaVinci Resolve, I think, is one of the best available. Has that reputation. Yes, yes. but it's, it's also more specialized for After Effects and things like that. And I don't believe that it has that ability to monitor the audio waveform so that you can do the kind of editing that I do, okay? If you're just cutting at some place in the video and chopping out a piece, you can use almost anything. But, yeah, you know. Yeah, well, it's searching through it. That, yeah, I use Shotcut to on Linux to do some video editing, but last time I did video editing, it was mostly around drone videos. So it was... And I made my choice. So there wasn't much audio. <laughs> I made my choice based on videos, avail training videos available on YouTube. Um, I found that uh, open source software has more video reviews than paid programs because there's more people using them out there that can write a review. And um, DaVinci is probably the most robust program that's available for free. Makes sense. My son, who does that sort of business along with his okay. audio I'm gonna, stuff. I'm going to end the meeting. Good. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Nice seeing you all. Good night, all. Good night. Come to the Good general morning. meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. On my list. <laughs>